I wanted to give an introduction to the question of sustainability uh, in the case of food, food security. Because the last big famine we had in the subcontinent, India, Bangladesh, at that time it was not a Bangladesh, it was undivided Bengal, was the great Bengal famine of 1942-43, when several million children, women and men died. And uh, the Roman philosopher Seneca said long ago, the hungry person listens neither to reason nor religion, nor is bent by any prayer. This is why in some parts of our country, what you call the Naxalite movement and so on, are all associated also with the extensive occurrence of unemployment and various kinds of deprivation. Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister, when he took over the Prime Ministership of Independent India, he said everything else can wait but not agriculture. The reason again, the backdrop of the Bengal famine was very much in his mind. Well, I am cutting a long story short from the time we had the Bengal famine uh, to the time Indira Gandhi announced in 1968 the wheat revolution. She released a special stamp. Uh, the wheat revolution stamp shows how there was a quantum jump in wheat production. It was not a small incremental 3%, 4%. It was a doubling of wheat production and that is why it was called the wheat revolution. And the picture of the stamp shows the library building of the Indian Agricultural Research Institute here in New Delhi in order to symbolize the role of science. Green Revolution was really represents a synergy between technology and public policy. Technology alone cannot make much of an impact unless there is a public policy. For example, today we are very proud of our Indian Space Research Organization. Chandrayaan, normally what happens is the political decision is that our ISRO should develop technology for landing on the moon and impact uh, uh, a probe. And rest of it science does. That's what Kennedy did in the United States. In the early 60s, he said before the end of the 60s, an American should land on the moon. That was all the political decision. But then the technical people converted their political decision to reality. After all, Armstrong landed in moon in 1968, two years, of course, Kennedy didn't live to see what has happened. This is what is called a mission mode and the technology and public policy. When they now the origin of this wheat revolution can be traced to a hybrid made in the Norin experiment station in Japan. It was an interesting cross made by Dr. Gonzero Inozuka in 1935 when he obtained semi-dwarf varieties of wheat which had dwarf height but long panicle. The panicle was long. I am mentioning it because we had an earlier wheat called the Triticum spherococcum, called the Mahanjadaro wheat. It was held, uh, the kernels were found in Mahanjadaro excavation. But there, the plant was small, the head was also small. Here, for the first time, a small plant but long panicles. And this was used in the United States by Orville Vogel in Washington State to develop a variety called Gaines. The same genes were used in Mexico by the famous Dr. Norman Borlaug, who later on got the Nobel Peace Prize. The difference between Vogel and Borlaug was, Vogel's varieties were all what we call winter wheat. They require long days and mild temperature. Ours are rubby now, it is November, we have started the rubby season. It is more short days and of course milder temperature. These are equal to spring wheats of the West and Borlaug's wheats were spring wheat. We received the material in 1962-63, dwarf stature coupled with long panicles at the IRI. <coughs> we developed what we call a five-year plan. It is published as five years of research. It is not part of the Planning Commission five-year plan. It was our own scientist five-year plan. We, so we developed our own five-year plan. The first was invite Dr. Borlaug, 63-64, national demonstrations in farmers' fields, 64-65, selection of material, then finally, 67, 68, we had predicted if all these things we suggest will be done, then 67, 68 will mark a new beginning in the agricultural history of India. And that happened. Normally, in biology, it may not happen because agriculture is a very risky profession. You can have drought, you can floods, but it so happened for the good fortune of the country. It happened that the five-year plan exactly <laughs> like Chandra and went also. It exactly went in the same way uh, and got it. Now, the reason for this 
revolution was a green revolution symphony i am mentioning it today because there is frequent talk of second green revolution why are we not having green revolution and so on the green revolution or any revolution can come only if you have got all the yeah, all the links in the chain completely in place for example the 1968 green revolution was because mutually reinforcing packages of technology <coughs> of services public policies public policies particularly with reference to input output pricing marketing that is assured and remunerative marketing holds a key and above all if you and i may talk about agriculture but who produces foods the farmers who work in sun and rain farmers like in fact uh, the green revolution was really spearheaded by sikh farmers sikh farmers of the punjab in whose blood i say farming is in their blood extraordinarily dedicated farmers one of those farmers who undertook a national demonstration the historical importance of this achievement is indian farmers achieved as much progress in wheat production in 4 years as during the preceding 4000 years from mohandas banja daro uh, to 1947 it was also even before uh, the green revolution started uh, the green revolution started in the united states in the early 40s with hybrid corn or hybrid maize that was the first major breakthrough which could scientific genetic breakthrough which can give yields much higher than the previous varieties the hybrid corn uh, then started the use of fertilizer pesticides and so on and you all know rachel carson's famous statement silent spring in 1962 <clears throat> and albert schweitzer uh, when he read the book he said man has lost the capacity to foresee and to forestall he will end by destroying the earth will be in, in destroying the earth and that was his now in 1967 <coughs> when i was used to travel a lot in punjab villages haryana what we call the heartland of the green revolution punjab haryana and western up i found farmers were very enthusiastic and they wanted another even shorter plant called triple dwarf there was sort of clamor for <coughs> hypothetical triple dwarf wheat <coughs> and they were applying lot of it wanted to apply too much fertilizer wanted to get 10 tons it's a 5 ton then my address at the science congress in varanasi on january 3rd 1968 i gave a talk on sustainable food production intensive cultivation of land without conservation of soil fertility and soil structure would lead ultimately to a spring up of deserts in other words soil health destruction over utilization of ground water depletion of the aquifer excessive use of fertilizers pesticides and also replacement of local varieties with one or two genetic strains because genetic homogeneity enhances genetic vulnerability to pests and diseases and so this was the beginning of what you may call a movement for evergreen revolution soon afterwards the united nations after the stockholm conference had set up a commission under gro harlan brundtland who was prime minister of norway for many years also who world health organization director general it was called our common future i was president of iucn the world conservation union at that time and i said there can be no hap happy common future without a better common present you need a better common present to have a better common future in other words excessive poverty excessive inequity whether it is economic or gender inequity is not good for a happy future so the concept of green to an evergreen revolution came green revolution is based on a commodity centered approach the first five crops in which we had a yield breakthrough was wheat rice jowar bajra and maize these five crops and government of india introduced what is called a high yielding varieties program in these crops in the beginning so it was a commodity centered increase in productivity there were changes in plant architecture harvest index that is the apportionment of total photosynthate to the grain rather than to the straw and also change in the physiological rhythm in sensitive to photoperiodism but in the case of evergreen revolution it means its definition of evergreen revolution is increasing productivity in perpetuity without associated ecological harm in other words how do you because in a country like ours where over 80% of farmers are small farmers you have to produce more and more from the same land without destroying the soil fertility destroying the aquifer and so on 
you can achieve uh, evergreen revolution by two methodologies one is organic farming cultivation without any use of chemical inputs like mineral fertilizers chemical pesticides <clears throat> it has to be done largely with the help of animals crop livestock integrated farming if you have both crop and livestock then you can have the manure for the field and so on the other method is called we call green agriculture but the difference is you can use integrated pest management integrated nutrient supply and also scientific uh, uh, natural resources management and so on you can use the minimum essential pesticide minimum essential urea or any other fertilizer and also you can grow either uh, normally mendelian breeding or molecular breeding basic principle of farming is if farm ecology and economics go wrong nothing else will go right now it is very important universities i am again happy that uh, the vice chancellor has taken the lead in promoting the sustainable development for example <clears throat> uh, in 1980 when indira gandhi came back to power in the then plan 6 by a plan we introduced a whole set of programs universities and eco development it was called universities eco development one was the ganga action plan i'm glad our prime minister has now again revived the ganga plan uh, that means there were 20 universities along the ganga from the sagar to uh, to gangotri you had a number of universities the idea was to involve all of them in a longitudinal study of ganges pollution how to manage pollution and how to create the nss volunteers could spread information why we should keep the ganga clean otherwise it will not be possible education and awareness generation are absolutely might similarly along the himalayas from nehu up to srinagar you had a large number of universities how what what role will they play in eco development it is not each individually but a coordinated action plan in which all of them both the faculty and the students will take part in himalayan ecosystem similar one on the western ghats along the western ghats starting from pune the university at pune you go on mangalore all of them universities combine them knowledge traditional knowledge was mentioned by the vice chancellor large number of varieties one of the basic principles of evergreen revolution is genetic diversity genetic diversity i mentioned earlier genetic homogeneity is not very uh, is not conducive to sustainable agriculture these tribal we call tribal people they are very very knowledgeable they live with nature for example this lady in orissa the koraput region is a center of origin a center of diversity of rice the large number of varieties of rice there thanks to people like her what she does is before the grain becomes ripe she harvests it and keeps it otherwise they will scatter the dispersal of seeds they will all you will not be able to harvest it she knows exactly when this lady for example maintains so many so many varieties of rice <clears throat> we have a farmers rights database like this surudan uh, all these varieties have tribal names tribal taxonomy is a value added taxonomy because its taxonomy plus the purpose for which the variety is grown something will be drought tolerant something will be salt tolerant something will be insect resistant so the name itself or good quality some some of them like kala jeera it is very good they say for health a number of diseases medicinal rices so many rices are there and that that is why the tribal taxonomy is exceedingly important fortunately in the last few years after the after the uh, we had two major legislation plant variety protection and farmers rights act and the biodiversity act both of them provide for recognition and reward to primary conservers government has set up a genome savior award for primary conservers we have been recommending a similar one for animals excellent animals we used to have very good buffaloes badavari buffalo along bundelkhand which had 14% butter fat content 14% 15% butter fat unlike the other now murra and so on which have got 7 8% but they are 14% we have lost most of them along the rajasthan canal was the rathi breed very hardy desert breed so unless people now conserve these animals also not only plant varieties animals also <coughs> now we also need as i said education so we started from our foundation what we call genome clubs <coughs> this to bridge the genetic divide genome clubs in schools and tribal areas 
understanding the plant genome, even the human genome. One advantage of studying human genome is, you know, all people will then see how irrelevant are all these artificial differences between every each one of us in, within the human kind. You may be anything, you may have belonged to any religion, <coughs> but our genome is the same. 99 over 99.9 percent .9 of the genome is common. <coughs> Whether you are black or white, I am happy the U.S. has now transcended the problem of race and had developed, selected a... Now, in, in genetics there is no disparity. There are differences in genetic makeup. But this kind of thing from childhood, from the university, now the Department of Biotechnology has extended this program of genome clubs all over the country. Formerly our universities also used to play a very important role by maintaining botanical and zoological gardens. Uh, uh, now, even now there are some botanical gardens, many of them are not well funded. For example, the Kew Botanical Garden, it's not attached to the university, one of the world famous universities. We have also a chip in, in Calcutta, one of the National Botanical Garden. Uh, this is where, you see, a botanical garden in the past was also the route to transfer genetic material between one country to the other. The heavier Brazilians, the Brazil, the rubber, natural rubber, came from Brazil to UK, Sir Henry Wickham brought it, then Sir Henry Wickham brought seeds of the same rubber to Sri Lanka in, 19, in 1875. <coughs> the Sri Lanka plants are still there, the original rubber plants introduced by Sir Henry Wickham. But he introduced the plant today, it is a multi-billion dollar industry, the rubber industry, the natural rubber <coughs> is in such great demand and uh, this is one of the great blessings you had it from Brazil, but today India, for example, the natural rubber industry has grown enormously because synthetic rubber, once there was a fear, synthetic rubber may replace natural rubber, but synthetic rubber cannot have the same heat tolerance. See, when you, when you see a plane landing, you will see sparks on the tire, enormous amount of heat is generated. So the rubber must have the ability to, so natural rubber has that property and that is why it is in great demand. Well, we are now spoiling the environment and that's therefore a group of countries, there is a genetic uh, trust, heritage trust, along with the Norwegian countries. The Norwegian countries, or always Nordic countries, have been very, very environmentally conscious, even before Stockholm and so on. Off the coast of Norway, in a place uh, in, near the North Pole, a, a perma, under permafrost condition, a very large gene bank has been set up. It can store several million. It is like a Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark, when you have lost everything, you are kept somewhere. There are gene banks in our own in, in Delhi, they are the National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, which has also a capacity for nearly a million seed samples can be maintained there. In other words, these are called XC2 conservation. It is no compensation for in C2. XC2 is only preservation under ice and cryogenic condition. But in C2 is both preservation plus evolution. It is all the time evolving. That is where the actual conservation comes in. Now, we need to have, like uh, for a sustainable agriculture movement, need some demonstrated large areas where we can show how sustainable agriculture or evergreen revolution can be practiced. We called it a special agricultural zone <coughs> where there are ecological problems. How to convert it into a sustainable agricultural system based on the principles of ecology, of economics, equity, employment and energy, renewable energy. For example, the Rajasthan Canal or the Indira Gandhi Canal as it is now called is a good example. It's a really technological marvel in the sense our engineers from Roorkee and other places could design the canal, take the water but if you go there on either side now, there are a large number of ecological problems. There is siltation of the canal, there is salinization of the area. This has to be maintained in an ecologically sound way. This is why I said this can be an arid zone, special agricultural zone, where you can demonstrate the evergreen revolution. <coughs> in spite of our green revolution, in spite of all the progress we have made, India is the home for the largest number of undernourished people. It's very unfortunate. On one hand, we have advanced technologically. On the other hand, we are still the largest new number of hungry persons. More recently, the International Food Policy Research Institute had published a hunger, state hunger index 
they are showing the Madhya Pradesh as the worst of the affected here. This morning addressing the sanit sanitation conference I mentioned, there are three aspects of food security. One is availability of food in the market. We are all right there. Access to food economically, purchasing power. That is also improving with the NARIGA, NREGA, National Rural Employment Guarantee Program. Even those who have no money at all are able to buy food. But where we are not making progress is the absorption of food in the body. In other words, sanitation, environmental hygiene, and associated primary health care. Enormous load of intestinal infection, unclean drinking water, and sanitation. So that availability, access, and absorption Absorption can be solved only by better sanitation and environmental hygiene. I think that must be the reason why our hunger is still very stubborn. It always puzzled me. Why is it in spite of all the PDS, public distribution system, ICDS, noon meal program, NREGA, why our figures are not going down in hunger? Uh, marginally they go in percentage but not in numbers because we are still adding to the population 16 to 17 million people every year. So it is important, therefore, to look at this in its totality. Uh, and uh, magnitude of the malnutrition problem is very serious. Almost 50% of under 5 children are malnourished. Under 5, underweight. 22, 30% children are born with low birth weight, with consequent disabilities in brain development, cognitive abilities, in the knowledge era, and so on. I don't want to give you more uh, sad data, but the fact remains that we must be conscious of the fact that a very large number of our countrymen, our own uh, brothers and sisters and children, are having serious problems in terms of uh, adequate nutrition. And that is not only because of lack of food in the market. Because Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia are the two major hunger hotspots of the world. Sub-Saharan Africa, there is a problem of availability, but not in South Asia. South Asia is not availability, but now, we can, for example, even with an enormous amount of genetic variability, our agro-biodiversity is very rich. We have problems like vitamin A deficiency, minerals, iron, iodine, and so on. But we have a whole set of vegetables. Vegetables, fruits, and which can up what we call horticultural remedy for nutritional maladies. So the National Horticulture Mission, one of the things we will do, Dr. Ashok Rampalai, in the course also, is to indicate how using the big missions, National Horticulture Mission is 20,000 crore mission, how do you mainstream, will run a course for home science graduates to influence the, their own areas, how do you really mainstream nutrition in the horticulture mission, so that the horticulture mission is not to grow some banana for export and so on, but it is also to address the immediate nutritional requirement of our own children, particularly micronutrient deficiency. The community food and water security system ultimately is the most sustainable. If your community will take it up, develop a gene bank, technically called in situ on farm conservation of land races, seed bank, grain bank, I find the audience uh, to Professor Suman Sahai, she has developed such banks in Jharkhand and Uttarakhand. Very, it's a very important method of helping people to develop their own self-reliant methods of food security the grain bank, the seed bank, water bank, so the water security. Well, more recently, last year, a year ago, Shri Shad Pawar, the Minister for Agriculture, announced a new policy for farmers, national policy for farmers. Neither in colonial period nor in independent India, we have had a policy for farmers. We have had policies for agriculture, for farming, not for farmers. The first policy in the whole history, in both colonial and independent history, is a farmer. What does it say? The most important point is how do you improve the economic well-being of the farmers? In other words, measure progress of farmers, farming, through increase in the improvement of income of the farmers, the real income of the farmers. It's all right for you and me, so many million tons, but the farmer, the individual requires their own income. They don't have a pay commission and so on. They have to have also some income. This is why the income orientation through value addition and through proper the other thing is very provide adequate opportunities for non-farm employment. Today there are 60% of our population is agriculture. That is not sustainable over a period of time because it was, we, have, we were 75% when we had a population of 300 million just before independence. When we were 30 crores of people, 75%. 
Now 60% of 1.1 billion people, 1.1, almost doubled the population of India when we became independent. It is not sustainable over a period of time. My own view is by 2020, 2025, we should bring down the number of people directly working in the farm, plowing and so on, to about one third of the population. I don't think we can go beyond it. Although industrialized countries have 2 to 3 uh, percent, they, they started long ago. We, uh, modern industry is not very job oriented. They have more jobless growth. And uh, jobless growth is joyless growth. But we have to bring more non-farm employment through agro-processing, value addition to primary products and so on. And there are two special categories, youth, the majority of our population are young people. They are not attracted to farming. Even the elder people, 40% of those interviewed by the National Sample Survey Organization said they would like to quit farming if they have an, if they have an alternative opportunity. If there is an opportunity to do so, they will quit farming. Where will they go? They can't go, and except come to slums in cities and so on. Youth will be attracted to farming, only if farming becomes intellectually satisfying and economically rewarding. Similarly, increasing feminization of agriculture. If you go to Uttarakhand and so on, men have gone to add some income to the family. You take Vidarbha, all the widows, people, the farmers. The large Mahila Kisan number is growing in this country, but there is no policy at all for women farmers, the support systems which they require. And so we must have, and then finally, of course, we must safeguard the ecological foundation for sustainable agriculture. So what kind of paradigm shift you require from green to an evergreen revolution? First, research strategies to meet the challenge of diversity of farming system don't have the same agronomy everywhere, suited to location-specific conditions. Diversity of farming conditions and agroecological, socio-economic, social-cultural conditions. Then more and more participatory breeding with farming families. For example, the, in Koraput, a variety of Kalajira was developed, an improved variety of Kala, strain of Kalajira was developed purely by participatory breeding with tribal women and men. The participatory knowledge management so that you combine frontier knowledge with traditional wisdom, the ecological prudence of the past is combined. Proactive advice on land use based on home needs, nutritional deficiencies, and market opportunity. From a cropping system to a farming systems approach, the difference is cropping system involves crop crop, say rice wheat rotation. But farming system includes animals also. It may be a poultry, it may be uh, small ruminants like sheep or goats, or it may be large ruminants like buffalo and cow. It's a mixed farming system. It used to be common before, gradually it has gone. So it is necessary to have a farming systems approach. So it can be fish also, crop, animal, fish uh, can be, and uh, so that natural resource and pest management. Proactive research on the mitigation of the adverse impact of climate change. Now, green to an evergreen revolution, improving soil fertility and fostering a soil health care movement and giving every farmer a soil health monitoring card. This will be part of the Agenda 21, which the students will prepare for their own area. Uh, adoption of agroforestry systems, exceedingly important, using nitrogen-fixing species like Sioux Babul, Lucina leucocephala, and above all, rainwater harvesting and more income per drop of water. I mentioned earlier that you require a large movement for non-farm employment. The Chinese, for example, between 1980 and 86, they removed 100 million people from farm to non-farm through what they call township village enterprises. We may not be able to do it, but our concept of bio-village, bio-village links ecological security with livelihood security, two sides of the same coin, livelihood security and ecological security create a large number of employment opportunities uh, to, it can be self-help groups of women, women and men, depends on the area, uh, biopesticide, bio biofertilizers, which are needed for sustainable agriculture, bio-valleys, bio-valley means along with the watershed, bio-industrial watershed you can call it, a bio-valley, where you create a number of small, small employment opportunities, for example, medicinal plants, small micro enterprises supported by microcredit, it may be self-help groups and so on. He said Bio Valley is to biotechnology what Silicon Valley is to information technology. It means you develop a whole set of infrastructure. The whole biomass utilization, 
if i say that we have produced 120 million tons of rice in the country the rice plant has also produced 250 million tons of other biomass the straw the leaf the bran the husk what are we doing with it we are only giving figures in terms of yield of grain but what about the rest of the part the rice bio park is one method by which in this particular model you can make 29 different value added products from the bran the husk and the straw <coughs> it's very important there's a large interest today in biodiesel bio oils bio oils are palm oil jatropha rapeseed rape seed but biodiesel people don't realize for 1 megawatt of power you require nearly 700 700 hectares of land 700 hectares of land so that that is why there is a concern if you divert land from food to fuel then food security will suffer in fact last year the maize price went up very high largely because the state of Iowa in the United States which is their corn state diverted much of their corn to the production of uh, alcohol the ethanol production uh, because there is a great demand for uh, for uh, the kind of bio biofuels and bio oils now evergreen revolution one of the dangers to evergreen revolution that is improvement of productivity in perpetuity is the impact of climate change what has been called by richard low as nature deficit disorder the children of today the children urban children of today are having according to him that's why he said lost child in the woods the child he took to the woods people are not going now even this campus has such beautiful trees and so on how many students and scholars living here have really appreciated the beauty of the flora here sometimes the fauna and so on so this is called nature deficit disorder nature deficit disorder we are deficit in nature our education system will have to help in overcoming this disorder because it can go to attention disorder it can lead to depression it can lead to obesity so mainstream harmony with nature we have fortunately gandhi ji's famous saying nature provides for everyone's need but not for everyone's greed uh, it is true in rice for example we have over 150000 varieties of rice in the world we have about 50000 of them in india and uh, many of them can grow when there is a flood say kosi flood if you have deep water rices they can grow above the flood water they can grow above the flood water so there are late if you see rice is a wide range of variability from kutanad in kerala below from rashikran below sea level to high altitude in the himalayas you grow everywhere now we must conserve them we must keep them ready we will you all right i don't know you must be enjoying potato which came from latin america but potato revolution took place in our country only because of a very important discovery by the scientists of the central central potato research institute simla they found that in certain parts of north india particularly punjab haryana region uh, this this september october uh, is an aphid free season aphid is the vector for virus diseases potato is susceptible to number of virus diseases so during if you produce a seed potato during the aphid free season then you can plant the tuber but once 2 degrees 3 degrees centigrade temperature goes up you will lose that advantage then what will happen to our potato you will have to grow it from true seed true seed like tomato brinjal and so on but we must now itself prepare what is known as tps true potato seed material in the former agriculture women like this will never grow a single crop it is always a mixed crop because their agronomy was a risk minimizing agronomy not a profit maximizing agronomy they wanted some crop or the other if there's a drought you have a legume you have a cereal you have got uh, ragi or bajra some other millets minor millets and so on uh, we should coping mechanism against natural calamity we have to learn from them and then then the whole area of knowledge transfer for which Uh, distance education where igno is our flagship there is enormous possibility today of uh, having linking all the villages of the country the last mile and the last person connectivity uh, can now be achieved through internet and cell phone or fm radio and uh, internet and then thanks to isro the indian space research organization we have now satellite connectivity to what we call village resource centers village resource centers at the block level satellite connection village knowledge centers internet connection at the village level the last mile and the last person through through connection between cell phone and 
Now, so way ahead in sustainable development, save dying crops, enlarge the food basket. From large, originally, there are books which, which chronicle, in the past, we depend upon our food and health security on three to 400 plants. Today, your PDS provides only wheat and rice. We have come down, the food basket has shrunk. Enlarge the food basket. Mainstream nutrition. Promote community food security system, the gene, seed, grain, water bank. Work towards an evergreen revolution, major farming system. Work towards a small farm management revolution. More than a second green revolution, what we need today is a management revolution in small farms by which we can give the small farmers the power and economy of scale because over 80% of the farms are one hectare and less. You all have read recently in Singor, 11,000 farmers were given compensation for 400 acres, 500 acres. What is the ownership per head? So it is getting a very small fragmented farm. It is important to have a small farm management and attract and retain youth in farming, empower women in agriculture. Kisan credit cards, we wanted data. Several crores of Kisan credit cards have been given. How many have been given to women farmers? Uh, Nabat said they don't keep data, gender disaggregated data, but privately said there may be two or three percent out of the whole card. Therefore, it is important to see that women farmers get credit and so on. Design safety nets to address the immediate needs of the hungry. And finally, at give attention to clean drinking water, sanitation, primary health care. Coming back once again to the indigenous knowledge, knowledge systems. Uh, in 1989, I was asked to develop a proposal in Guyana, Guyana, the British Guyana, uh, in, uh, in the Caribbean region. And uh, the then president gave one million acres of prime rainforest to the Commonwealth, Commonwealth for demonstrating what is meant by sustainable management of rainforest. The president said, everybody experts come to me and say, Mr. President, you must manage your forest sustainably. So he said, Mr. Expert, I give you land. You demonstrate what is meant by sustainable management of rainforest. And that was very clever of him. He gave a million, not a small amount, million. He has got 17 million acres of rainforest. So when I went there to the forest, I saw the, uh, the Amerindians, they are called. There are two, three groups of ethnic groups there. The, the Indo Indo Guyanese, the Afro Guyanese, <coughs> and the Amerindians. Indo Guyanese are about 47%. The president of Guyana is an Indo Guyanese. Afro Guyanese, about 43, 42%. The remaining are uh, Amerindians. This Amerindian song, when translated in English, means the sky is held up by trees. If the forest disappears, the sky, which is the roof of the world, collapses. Nature and man then perish together to say that you should not cut trees. So I made this man a director of the campus. And some of, them, some of my colleagues objected. He has not got university education. I said, doesn't matter. He knows about forests than any of us can do. He became the director of this campus, the Evokrama campus, this Amerindian chief, the Amerindian chief. Look at again when we had tsunami, December 26, 2004, uh, we had a tremendous problem. But the mangrove forests, wherever there were mangroves, they acted as a bio shield, a yeah, speed breaker, so that the tsunami did not. Wherever there were mangroves, people were saved. Again, as an illustration of ancient wisdom, if you go to the temple at Chidambaram, Lord Nataraja, the cosmic dance, you find there is a tem every temple is a temple tree, a temple tree. And this is Exocaria agalocha, Exocaria agalocha, a mangrove. Why did the people who built a Chidambaram temple choose a mangrove as a temple tree? Obviously, they must have had tsunamis or other kinds of problems earlier, and they found this was a savior. You see, whether you go to a sacred grove or a sacred tree, you find there's a reason for it, for the choice of the tree. You should, some of them have, some people have studied it, anthropologists and so on. Ultimately, the population supporting capacity of our ecosystem is being exceeded in many parts of India. We are overpopulated in many areas. The pressure of population on land and water. Water is becoming a difficulty. This is why a contemporary of Malthus, Condorcet, said that population growth can be limited if people have a duty towards those who are not at born. Their duty is not to give them existence, but to give them happiness. Very important, the happiness. This morning I come congratulate the Bhutanese minister one country which has developed an index called Gross National Happiness, not Gross National Product, 
GNP or GDP, but GNH. I think once we have that concept that our children must be in a happy society, then you have bio-happiness, uh, eco-happiness and so on. You have that uh, nature deficit disorder will go away and we'll have more and more. No. I call this the philosophical underpinning of the evergreen revolution. Modern man must re-establish an unbroken link with nature and with life. He must again learn to invoke the energy of growing things and to recognize, as did the ancients in, Indian, in India centuries ago, that one can take from the earth and the atmosphere only so much as one puts back into them. This is the basis of the evergreen revolution. The other one, green revolution, has became a greed revolution. Greed revolution means you exploit, over-exploit the groundwater, you over-exploit, you apply too much fertilizer, wanting to make short-term gains. The short-term gains in the long term. This sentence is very important for sustainable ag sustainability science. One can take from the earth and the atmosphere only so much. There is carbon emission and carbon absorption. This is quite a very foresighted statement in the atmosphere how between the balance between carbon emissions and the carbon absorption. In their hymn to earth, the sages of Adarva Veda chanted, and I quote, What of these I dig out, let that quickly grow over, let me not hit thy vitals or thy hearts. That is the principle of sustainable development. Don't hurt the vitals, that is, don't remove the forest, don't destroy the soil, don't pollute the lakes and water. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope uh, this initiative of uh, IGNOME in uh, a contribution as it has been called to our sustainable future will attract attention not only from students but from others who are interested in practicing their sustainable life, sustainable lifestyles and so on. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.